Welcome to Introduction to Skimmer Sediment Basins, Basics of Design to Advanced Modeling, presented by Rymar Waterworks Innovations, the manufacturer of the Marley Float Skimmer. My name is Jamie McCutcheon, and I'm a 1992 graduate of Clemson University with a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering. In 1999, I founded SeaCAD Engineering to provide land planning and site development related services in the upstate of South Carolina. In 2018, CCAD was acquired by Davis and Floyd. In 2013, I invented the Marley Float Skimmer and founded SW Products. In 2018, we rebranded as Rymar Waterworks Innovations. I'm a licensed professional engineer in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, and a member of IECA, ASCE, ASDM, and CESWA. The introduction to skimmer sediment basins course objectives are to understand what a skimmer is and why it is used, to learn the fundamentals of skimmer basin design, to gain a basic understanding of advanced skimmer modeling, and lastly to become aware of benefits of post-construction uses for skimmers. There are 30 states that currently have surface withdrawal requirements. Those states that do not have surface withdrawal requirements are likely to have them within the next few years as the EPA is adding this to the construction general permit on most states as they renew. In most cases, states with surface withdrawal requirements generally do not have an approved list of devices. They defer to the engineer of record to specify a method or device to meet this requirement. However, you will find that many Department of Transportations and some MS4s do have specific requirements for approved list or a QPL for devices that are allowed to be used in their area. <clears throat> Most construction general permits have a clause regarding surface outlets. For this example from the Ohio EPA, you'll see that surface outlets are listed and it states, when discharging from sediment basins, utilize outlet structures that withdraw water from the surface unless less feasible. Most states also note that the circumstances in which it is infeasible to design out the structure in this manner are rare, thereby they generally require surface withdrawal from most sediment basins. So the evolution of skimmer technology. Skimmers or floating surface drains have been around for many years. Some states have required their use for quite some time, while others are just beginning to implement surface withdrawal regulations or updating their regulations uh, based upon advancements in the products. TRI Environmental, which is located at the Denver Downs Research Facility in Anderson, South Carolina, has done extensive skimmer testing and research. They were actually hired by the state of Georgia when Georgia was updating its state sediment and erosion control manual, known as the Green Book, to assist in that update. Excerpts from their award-winning paper that they prepared for ICA are included as the blue sides in this presentation. Traditionally, the principal spillway of most basins is a vertical riser pipe with perforations. Typically have gravel around the lower half and it's intended that the gravel will filter out sediment as the water flows through it. Even with the gravel filter, the perforations, the lower elevations of the riser allow discharge to pass, which has a relatively high level of turbidity and sediment concentrations. Over time, the gravel filter surrounding the riser is coated with sediment that traps and detains water in the basin. Ponds <clears throat> look something like this with a perforated riser here, stone filter ring, and then an outlet near the bottom. As you can see from this basin, mud is coating the bottom of the pond and likely coating the face of the filter ring. And a significant amount of sediment is getting into the orifice, which is located at the bottom of the basin where sediment accumulations are highest. So the floating surface skimmer or floating pond skimmer is a buoyant device that releases or drains water from the surface of sediment ponds, traps, or basins at a more controlled rate of flow. It skims <coughs> or dewaters from the surface where sediment concentrations are at a minimum in the water column instead of draining from the bottom where sediment concentrations are the highest. The skimmer serves two primary functions to facilitate drainage of the pond and to reduce turbidity, but primarily reduce sediment concentration of the effluent discharge, 
as the reduction in turbidity is typically minimal and maybe around 10 percent. So for example this is the Marley float skimmer and it has a guard so it pulls water from just below the surface flow comes under the guard through the orifice and then out the outlet pipe uh, to the outlet structure. This unique design allows for trash and debris to be on the surface to not get to the orifice and to be trapped by the sediment basin. There are several other types of skimmers. You have the Faircloth skimmer, the Erosion Supply Company skimmer, the IAS skimmer, and again the Marley Float skimmer. There may also be other brands on the market or coming soon. Product designs and discharge rate. TRI determined that each product and each product size has a unique design including the associated hydraulics that are affected by the flotation, inlet, connecting tube, coupling, etc. The discharge rate is dependent on the specific product design and can only be determined through product specific full scale as installed testing. To demonstrate this we'll look at three types of three inch skimmers that TRI tested during their research. So their test tank is four feet deep, so you have a, float, a depth from zero to four feet. And you'll see that two of the three inch skimmers had a flow rate of about 37 GPM, while one three inch skimmer had a flow rate of nearly 70 GPM. As the depth in the tank increased from one feet to four feet, you'll also see that all of the skimmers had an increase in flow rate of about 25%. So if you just specify a three inch skimmer, you could get one that flows at 40 to 50 GPM, or you could get one that flows at 70 to 90 GPM. So it is critical to not only specify the skimmer size, but also pay attention to the flow rate for each manufacturer's brand. Again, critical to compare flow rates, and you can't assume the same size isn't equal when it comes to skimmers, as they often flow differently. One example of how the uh, that restricts flow or can affect the flow of a skimmer. Several skimmers use a flexible coupling. Some of them are several feet long and when the pond shallow that coupling can float and create an air pocket. That air pocket may restrict the flow more than even the orifice. This is just one example of many different things that impact the flow of the skimmer. So in conclusion, floating pond skimmers are very useful. Uh, for improving the performance of a sediment basin. They reduce retention times associated with meeting a desired water quality standard. They discharge cleaner water and they provide more consistent predictable drawdown times, especially when compared with a traditional perforated riser. They're also easier to maintain if they do clog than a traditional perforated riser. However, the unique design of the skimmer and its associated hydraulics can greatly affect the rate at which it is able to dewater sediment pond, trap, or basin, thus determining product-specific flow rates based on each unique design through full-scale as-installed testing is of the utmost importance. Again, this was the conclusion of TRI when they did a study of skimmers for IECA. As an example of that, you can see here that our flow rate chart um, all skimmers have a flow rate curve. Uh, the Marley float has three different models with different orifice configurations. You can see the smaller models have a relatively small difference in flow rate, while the large model, the five, six, and eight inch models, have a relatively larger <coughs> difference in flow rate as depth increases. When Georgia updated their manual for erosion and sediment control, they asked TRI to do their testing and they and research, and they came up with the new standards for floating surface skimmers. And included in the manual is a discussion about product designs and how each product and each product size has unique design and discharge rates and should be determined based on full scale as installed testing. Georgia also has this standard note required on most plans where they specify the size of the basin, the time to drain, um, that can also be a range of time as we'll discuss later, the skimmer dimensions, including the orifice size and head, and the manufacturer's name so that you're able to look at the manufacturer's uh, flow rates and determine the flow rate for that particular brand and size of skimmer. 
We're now going to discuss the three fundamentals of sediment basin design. Those are volume, time, and flow rate. Fundamental number one, basin volume. The basin volume is based on the area flowing to the basin. Regulations differ as to total area or disturbed area, so you need to check your local state requirements. And a general standard that we see in many areas is a volume of 3,600 cubic feet per acre flow into the basin. So for example, if you had 10 acres flow into a basin times 3,600 cubic feet, your required volume for the basin would be 36,000 cubic feet. Some areas also require basins to have a permanent pool or sediment storage volume that is below what is drained by the skimmer. So dewatering time. Sediment basins work by allowing time for sediment to settle to the bottom and by pulling the cleaner water from the top of the water column. The time required will vary based on soil type. Obviously sands settle quickly, but silts and clays take much longer if they settle at all. A standard that is seen in many areas and many regulations is a two to five day drain time. And note that engineering judgment is needed to balance the need for extended times for certain soil types versus the frequency of rain events, as the basin should drain, if not completely, but nearly completely, before you expect the next significant rain event. So the third fundamental is flow rate. So once the basin volume and dewatering times are established, then the required flow rate range is easy to determine. It's simply basin volume divided by dewatering time equals flow rate. So you'll use the minimum dewatering time to determine your maximum flow rate and the maximum dewatering time to determine your minimum flow rate. And once this range is determined, you can select an appropriate skimmer based on manufacturer specifications that fall within those flow rates. For example, on a 36,000 cubic foot volume, if you want to drain it in two days, that would be a skimmer that would flow at 18,000 cubic feet per day. However, if you want to drain it in five days, you'd use a smaller skimmer that drains in 7,200 cubic feet per day. And note that a lower flow rate will often result in a smaller and typically less expensive skimmer, which is also a benefit to the developer and contractor. <clears throat> it's interesting to look at some different state standards. Here we have standards for five states, just for reference and as comparison. So if you look at the basin volume requirements, you'll see that some are 3,600 cubic feet per acre, others are 1,800 cubic feet per acre, such as North Carolina and Georgia. And Ohio has a requirement for 1,800 cubic feet per acre, plus an additional 1,000 cubic feet per acre of the disturbed area for the sediment storage. Kentucky is interesting in that it is soil type dependent, and they use a calculation based on the soil type to determine the required volume. For surface area, we see typically something that's based either on a 10-year storm or two-year storm, as it is in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. Ohio does not specify a surface area, but has a maximum depth of five feet, which tends to lead to <clears throat> larger surface area, particularly on larger sites. And Kentucky, again, it depends on the soils type and basin ratio, so it's calculated for each site. The principal spillway, which is generally considered the skimmer, and the riser itself is typically going to handle a 10-year storm or two-year storm, depending on which state you're in. And then most states also require an emergency spillway to handle any rain events over what the principal spillway will handle, which could range from a 10-year, 25, or 100-year event. It's interesting to see where skimmers are actually required versus preferred. In South Carolina, technically, they're only required for 10 acres or larger. However, they are preferred for smaller sites or smaller basins. In North Carolina, they're generally required on nearly all sediment basins. In Georgia, they're not technically required in the Georgia manual, um, although they are referenced in the construction general permit, but they are strongly preferred. And again, Georgia requires skimmers to be based upon tested flow rates rather than orifice equations. In Ohio, it's 10 acres, and in Kentucky, it's typically five acres. And the last standard that we like to look at is dewatering time. North and South Carolina both have a two to five day dewatering time. Georgia has no standard and leaves it up to the engineer, 
while Ohio has a two to seven day time. Kentucky time is not standard, <clears throat> but simply whatever is required to meet an 80% trapping efficiency. And in Kentucky, they typically use software uh, such as SEDCAD to model the sediment trapping efficiency of each basin. So RIMAR has developed several sediment basin details, and these are available on our website at www.marleyfloat.com for free. There's no login or sign up required. A couple of things to point out on this detail. So this detail is for a temporary skimmer sediment basin, which in this case would not have a permanent riser structure, it's simply a pipe through the dam and the skimmer and a spillway. So we have sediment basin design criteria here on the left. And you'll see a length to width ratio, minimum and maximum, a volume required, again, depending on what state you're in or what MS4 you are, the same for surface area. And then we have a place here where you can specify your minimum and maximum dewatering time. At the bottom of the detail, there's a data block in case you have multiple basins on a site. And again, these are available in CAD and PDF, and feel free to download and, and modify as needed. But the data block includes total drainage area to the basin, the disturbed area to the basin. Uh, in this case, we have a, a flow for your 10-year storm, although depending on the area, that may be a two-year storm or 25-year storm. We have basin volume. We have both required and provided, and we'll speak about this in more detail later, but that is a very important uh, piece of information to understand the difference between required and provided. You have basin surface area, again required and provided and again you want to just make sure that your provided meets your requirements. We have the outlet information, barrel size, spillway, size, elevation and width. Here we have the skimmer size, skimmer orifice diameter, skimmer manufacturer. Is an equal allowed? Yes or no? Typically that will be yes but there are some uh, situations where you will need to say no to that and require a specific skimmer with a very specific flow rate. And then we have the skimmer flow rate, the minimum and maximum. Again, that's based on your minimum and maximum dewatering time. <clears throat> we also have another version of the detail, which is more of your multi-purpose basin, where you do have a riser structure um, that will be part of the basin. And in this detail, we also have a permanent pool portion. Now we have temporary basins with permanent pools and permanent basins without permanent pool details on the site as well. The main difference here is you will have a sediment storage volume requirement and you'll have a sediment storage volume and dewatering volume in your data block. Um, on the dewatering volume or the required volume and the required versus provided, it's important to base the skimmer size on the required volume rather than the provided volume. Generally, the provided volume is going to be equal to or more than the required volume, and oftentimes the provided volume can be far more than the required volume if this basin is going to become your permanent detention pond. So, for example, if your required volume were 10,000 cubic feet, but your provided volume was 30,000 cubic feet, and you based your skimmer size on the provided of 30,000, you would actually dewater or drain out the required volume of 10,000 cubic feet in much less time than the required minimum time. So therefore, it's important to base the skimmer size on the required volume rather than provided volume in most cases. <clears throat> so again, on our website, we have a simple Excel design tool available. Again, it's free to download, no sign in, login, or sign up required. The design tool includes a data block at the top to include basic project information, date, project name, location, the company, engineer's name, and a basin description. Uh, often you'll have sites with more than one basin, so it's important to identify which basin it applies to, and then other lines if you need to insert more information. We have the maximum and minimum time to drain that you'll plug in. We have pond depth. The pond depth 
will be the depth that is being drained by the skimmer. That would not be necessarily the full pond depth or depth above the top of the riser structure. You have a pond top length and width and a pond bottom length and width. Now we all understand that there are very few perfectly square or rectangular basins out there. So use your engineering judgment to adjust these dimensions so that your calculated pond volume is within a reasonable approximation to your actual pond volume that is being drained by the skimmer. Again, this is not your total pond volume. This is just the volume that you're looking for the skimmer to drain. So the full spreadsheet looks something like this, where it has each skimmer with each orifice configuration with each uh, flow curve data in place. I realize you can't read that on this presentation, but I just want to show how it calculates for every skimmer version. Then at the bottom of the page, there's a skimmer report tab. If you click on the report tab, it'll take you to a nice, neat one page printout that you can utilize in your report or on your plans. It'll have all the data that you entered. It will also have your inputs, including your, you know, to clearly identify your maximum and minimum times to drain and pond depth calculated volume. It will then calculate your minimum average flow rate and it'll also calculate your maximum average flow rate. And then because this is our tool, it will have a chart that will identify for you which of our skimmers meet the specified minimum or maximum time to drain and also provide the time to drain in hours for each skimmer configuration. Again, this is just a blow up to show that in this particular example, the different skimmers could drain the basin within seven hours to up to 295 hours. And two of the skimmers, both a two inch and a two and a half inch, met the selected criteria or specified criteria of 48 to 120 hours, uh, so could be utilized. So the engineer then uses the engineering judgment to determine if they want to use the skimmer that drains a slightly faster or slightly slower, but still within that uh, design criteria range. We've also developed a tool specifically for Ohio. Ohio, again, requires a sediment storage volume based on the disturbed area of 1,000 cubic feet per acre. And then it has a required dewatering volume based on the total drainage area that's 1,800 cubic feet per acre. So the difference in the tool is you, you plug in your disturbed area and total drainage area to determine these required volumes. And then you plug in these dimensions here to determine your calculated volume. Now we're seeing in this case, we've got a required volume of 18,000 cubic feet. We've got a calculated volume far in excess that, so that basin is way oversized uh, in this situation. But we did fix that, and in this case, we had a 27,000 cubic feet required dewatering volume. We calculated, based on the dimensions for the pond, a 27,200 cubic feet, so just slightly more than required, which is well within reason. And we specified a two-day to seven-day time frame based on Ohio requirements. So then again, based on those requirements, you see which skimmers meet the specification, and again, you have two skimmers, one drains in 77 hours, one drains in 109 hours, both within the 48 to 160 hour range. We're now going to move into some advanced skimmer modeling on a couple of different software platforms. However, if you do have any questions about the basic skimmer modeling or skimmer design tools, please feel free to reach out to us or contact us. We'll be glad to answer those. So now we're going to look at SEDCAD and how to use the Marley float and model it in SEDCAD. So if you're not familiar with SEDCAD, SEDCAD is a sedimentology modeling software. It takes into account the soil particle size and gradation. It takes into account the erosivity factors, rainfall factors, many other factors that all have an impact on the erosion on site and the trapping efficiency of a basin. We'll note that most sediment basins now specify for baffles to be used. 
and we typically see that the dead space can be set from 20%, which is typically what you use without baffles, to zero if you are using baffles. So you'll enter your watershed data. You'll enter your drainage area, your time of concentration, your curve number. You'll use your, enter your sedimentology data. The K, C, and P factors are all related to the erosivity and, and type of the soil, the condition of the soil, whether it's bare, whether it's graded, whether it's you know some sort of natural condition, et cetera. And SEDCAT has good help if you're not sure about what these factors should be. You'll also enter your length and slope and your soil type. Then you'll enter your basin info. So you'll use your elevation area table to establish your pond volume. So in this case, the bottom of our pond is at a 1040 elevation and has an area of the pond bottom of 0.04 acres. And it goes up to a 1056 elevation. So you've got a 16 foot deep pond in this case, which is a very deep pond. And at the top of the pond, it's 0.35 acres. So in order to model the skimmer with this, you want to set your stage increment on your elevation area table to 0 0.10 feet. And that is the key to entering your skimmer information. So then you're going to create your outlet structure. So you'll typically have a perforated riser. Again, that's just establishing the height of the riser and the size of the riser. And then typically you would have an orifice and you'd identify the size and elevation of that orifice. However, in this case, you're going to select user input discharge. When you do this, you'll get a table and that table will come up and allow you to enter in cubic feet per second the, the discharge for that orifice or for that, that skimmer. So you will enter at 1040 at the bottom is zero and then you'll enter wherever you have information. So on our details, <clears throat> we provide flow rate at 0.1 feet, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and then every half a foot up to four feet deep. So you'll go into your elevation table and enter at 0.1, at 0.3, at 0.5, and then every half a foot from there. SEDCAD will do the interpolation for you between points. You don't have to go and calculate all those. Just simply put in what you know. So if your basin is above four feet deep, you can just go to the top of the basin and continue the flow rate at the four foot elevation to the top of the pond. Um, if you're more comfortable extrapolating that out based on the flow rate curve, that's fine too. Again, this is your engineering judgment on how best to do this. But you'll see in this case, we've kept the flow the same from four feet deep up to the top of the pond. And when you do this, SEDCAD will then run a sediment graph and take into account the, the, the sedimentology and give you a plot out of peak sediment concentration in and peak sediment concentration out. One thing to be aware of is that SEDCAD does not take into account the surface withdrawal effect. The actual traffic efficiencies should be and typically will be higher than the calculated efficiency. SEDCAD assumes that the flow comes through the entire water column. And in doing that, <coughs> it does not give you the benefit of surface withdrawal that skimmers actually provide. In this case, our trapping efficiency was 91%. And South Carolina requires an 80% trapping efficiency, which seems to be a common standard in many places. However, if we had run this and we had gotten to a trapping efficiency of say 77 or 78%, it may well be within the engineer's judgment that because SEDCAD does not give benefit for the surface withdrawal and instead calculates through the entire water column, that is reasonable to believe that that basin actually would achieve at least an 80% trapping efficiency due to the surface withdrawal of the skimmer. We have in many cases explained this to reviewers and had agreement <coughs> that that is a reasonable assumption to be made rather than continuing to have to enlarge the basins to meet the magical 80% number. 
Again, if you have questions regarding SADCAD, please reach out to us. We'll be glad to offer assistance in how to model the skimmer in SADCAD correctly. Uh, the next software package we're going to discuss is Hydroflow Hydrographs. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Hydroflow. It is now built into uh, Autodesk, uh, at least their Civil 3D uh, platform. And it is ideal for determining your pre and post uh, flow rates uh, and doing your detention basin design. Now I want to mention at this time before we get into this, <clears throat> typically uh, many places do not require quantity control during construction so you don't necessarily have the need to model a skimmer in the detention basin um, to determine your pre versus post flow rates. However, there are some areas that do require quantity control during construction. Uh, we've seen this particularly when it comes to large mass graded subdivisions where during construction your subdivision may have a curve number uh, during the bare earth stage that's significantly higher than what the post construction curve number would be once all houses are in, yards are grassed, and areas have been stabilized. So <clears throat> we are going to go through how to model the Marley float in Hydroflow when you need to um, include it in your pre versus post calculations. I will also mention, as we're going to talk a little bit later, skimmers can often be used, particularly the Marley float, in post-construction situations to provide an outlet configuration that is less prone to clog than many of the low flow outlet sizes we often see, particularly on small sites now, to meet water quality requirements. But we'll speak to that in more detail later. So for the hydroflow discussion, we're going to look at a sample site. So this was a site <coughs> where we did the engineering. It was about a five acre site. We were disturbing about two and a quarter acres of the site and leaving about three acres uh, undisturbed. I guess about five and a quarter, five and three quarter acre site. This particular site had a sediment basin and then it had a road here. And on the other side of the road was a catch basin that we we're draining to. So for liability reasons and uh, based on the where this site was being developed, we wanted to make sure we had quantity control during construction. So our pre-development conditions, the area was about five and a half acres. It had a curve number of 59 for, for wooded, and it had a time of concentration of just under 20 minutes. In this area, we use a type two storm event. We're using a two minute time interval. So the in post <coughs> development scenario, the undisturbed area stayed the same as far as curve number and time of concentration, but the post development to the sediment basin changed. We had 2.23 acres. We had a curve number of 86 for a bare earth disturbed condition and a time of concentration of seven minutes. So again, you build your pond information. So in this case, our pond was four feet deep. So when we're building our stage storage chart, so we have our stage elevation, the contour area at that elevation, and then Hydroflow will calculate the incremental storage. Um, when you're building that, you have to build in data points in order to put in the flow rate later based on the skimmer. So again, we're going to build in a 0 0.1, a 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and then every half a foot up to the top of the basin. Once you build your elevation area table, and unfortunately you do have to calculate your contour area or estimate it between these elevations, um, you'll then, like we did before, plug in the data from the skimmer detail as far as the flow rate. So in this case, we're going to build our outlet structure. So we have culvert or orifice A, which is your the barrel going out of the detention pond. Uh, this was a complicated outlet structure, so we had an orifice C, which was a 6-inch orifice, 1.75 feet above the bottom of the pond, which was the 958 elevation. We then had a riser that was at 961.6, so about 3.6 feet tall. We had a rectangular riser 
that was nine at nine sixty one. <clears throat> so a little bit below just a, a rectangular cutout of the perforated riser, slightly below that. In this case, we're trying to discharge the entire, even up to the 100-year storm, through the riser so we don't have an emergency spillway in place. So then, if you look at the bottom of the chart, it'll give the flow for each orifice. So you can see culvert A, how it's flowing, culvert C, weir A, weir B, and then here we have a user-defined flow. So this is where you plug in your flow rate from the skimmer detail. So again, at 0.1 feet, you plug in the defined flow at 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and then every half a foot up to 4 feet. Again, if you're over 4 feet deep, you would either interpolate, I mean extrapolate, <clears throat> or you would just go slightly, you know, maintain that flow rate above 4 feet of depth. So hydroflow will interpolate between entry ports, and if the basin is over four feet deep, you use the flow rate at four feet depths, or the same flow rate at four feet for depths greater than four feet. So for this example, a Model 2 skimmer was modeled, and that's the flow rates in the user-defined pulled straight off the detail that are plugged in. If you look at the schematic of the outlet structure in hydroflow, Normally, you would see a low flow orifice at the bottom. In this case, you do not. You see the orifice that's 1.75 feet off the bottom. You see the rectangular weir, and then you see the top of the riser. But you don't have a low flow orifice showing on the schematic. However, you do see the flow here, which represents the skimmer flow, because again, our first orifice was about 1.75 feet off the bottom. And in this stage discharge, this green line represents the skimmer flow rate. So you can see it's a relatively small amount of flow, less than one CFS, you know, in that 0.2 to 0.3 CFS range. And then the other orifices kick in till we get our larger flow rate. Again, the table, once you plug this in, will identify the flow at each orifice and total flow. And you'll see that everything below one point. 75 feet is equal to the skimmer flow rate only and then the other orifices start to kick in. So in this example for our two-year storm we had a pre-development condition of about 2.34 CFS and we had a post-development condition of 2.48 CFS at our study point. So we had a slight increase of just over 0.1 CFS for the two-year storm which was approved by the reviewers. And in the 10-year storm, we have 9.5 CFS in our precondition and 9.0 CFS postcondition. So we had a reduction of about 0.5 CFS in flow rate <coughs> on the 10-year storm in the post-development condition. And again, this post-development condition was during construction with that curve number of 86 for that disturbed area. So as we discussed previously, a lot of states have a two to five day drainage time. In this particular instance, we also use SEDCAD, as we talked about earlier, to confirm that the sediment basin was meeting an 80% trapping efficiency. However, had we needed to go in and check, do we meet a 48 hour minimum drain time, we would go to our stage discharge hydrograph and we'd look at it and if we looked at it, we would see that this pond actually has a zero flow rate at 29 hours. And if you look closely, the pond doesn't fill up till about 12 hours. So really from full pond to empty pond is only about 17 hours of time. So in this case, had we been required to meet a minimum drainage time of 48 hours, we would not have met it. So we also checked our elevation versus time table to see that it actually is getting to the top of the pond. So that's the 961.6 there. Um, you know, top of the basin is actually 962, I believe in this case. So basically the pond's nearly full. So since our example did not meet the required 48 hour dewatering time, we went in and remodeled the basin with a different skimmer with a lower flow rate. So for this example, we used a model one with a two inch orifice 
rather than the Model 2 with the 5 inch orifice. In doing this, you can see that our flow continued until just over 66 hours. Um, and again, the pond didn't fill up till about 12 hours, so 66 minus 12, we had a fit about 54 hours from the time the basin was full to the time the basin drained out. So we did meet our 48 hour time frame if we needed to do so. Uh, again, we made to make sure the basin didn't overtop and we needed our freeboard. So in this example, a minimum one foot of freeboard was not required. It is required, so dam must be raised slightly in order to meet that. Um, so what also was interesting when we ran this using the smaller skimmer and then we checked our pre versus post flow rates. Again, our pre was 9.5 CFS but our post jumped up to nearly 11 CFS. So although we did hold the water for 48 hours, or over 48 hours, um, even reducing the skimmer size ended up increasing the overall flow rate. Uh, and that happens because water's not getting out as fast initially. Water gets higher in the basin and higher on the riser structure. So you, with more head on the riser structure, you get a higher overall overall flow rate. So had we been required to meet the 48 hour drainage time, this basin would have had to get larger in order to still meet the pre and post uh, requirements to maintain pre-development flow rates in the post-development or during construction condition. So if you have any questions regarding hydro flow, please let us know and uh, we'll be glad to try to help answer those. Now we're going to go into our last modeling software, which is HydroCAD. HydroCAD, if you're not familiar with it, is a very similar program to HydroFlow. However, the owners and developers of it um, have incorporated a number of proprietary products, including the Marley Float Skimmer, into it to make it a little easier and quicker to do the design. So it works very similar to HydroFlow, um, but when you're building your your outlet structure uh, rather than having to and when you're building your pond rather than having to build in those points uh, to be able to plug in the user input or user defined discharge you'll simply go to your structure create your riser and then <clears throat> when you go to put in your next portion um, you'll hit this load from file button uh, when you do that It'll come up with a list of uh, folders for different products. If you're modeling the Marley float, you go to the Marley float folder. You select the skimmer size and orifice configuration that you'd like to try. You select that Excel file or the um, CSV file. It will then automatically plug in. Again, it's got the 0 0.1, 0.3.5 all the way to four feet. Um, HydroCAD gives you the option that if it's over four feet of depth and you want to extrapolate, you just click on the extrapolate. And it'll take the last couple of um, <clears throat> data points and extrapolate that out on the curve. Uh, it'll let you do a discharge multiplier. So if you want to use two or three skimmers and see how that would impact you, you can do that. Um, Anyway, everything else is pretty similar to HydroFlow in HydroCAD. Um, that. So one other thing on HydroCAD, if you do want to check your flow rate time um, and, and how long it takes to drain the basin, you first have to go to your calculation settings and under that go to the time span tab and change your end time. Typically it's 24 hours. Push it on out to, in this case, it's been 120 hours. And then you right click on your node uh, for your pond uh, to go to that node report, right click there and it'll bring up the skimmer basin hydrograph and you can see in this case uh, the pre inflow outflow you know, and then the post inflow outflow uh, coming in there. So um, well, actually this is your, your inflow hydrograph is the green and your outflow hydrograph is the blue and you can see your inflow time inflow rate, your storage elevation, and your primary outflow. So in this case, 
outflow lasted to 65 hours. So again, we meet our 48 hour minimum time frame. So if you do have any questions on SEDCAD, HydroFlow, or HydroCAD, please reach out to us and we'll be glad to assist you with any modeling questions to make sure that you're uh, getting the inputs correct in order to get your outputs correct. So that concludes the modeling discussion, advanced modeling discussion on how to model skimmers in different uh, software packages including SEDCAD, HydroFlow, and HydroCAD. We've mentioned a couple times uh, going to our website for information. So on our website you can get uh, CAD files and PDFs as well as the, the design tool and our website is rymarwaterworks.com. When you go to our website, if you'll go to the top bar by product and go to Marley Float, uh, there'll be a drop down come when you, when you hover over that and you go to the Marley Float spec page. Um, we have the design tool in Excel there, the Ohio design tool, a comparison chart. So you can see our flow rates versus uh, other skimmers. We also have each model of skimmer. We have the uh, detail as a PDF and a CAD file. And we also have um, <coughs> cut sheets and installation instructions for each skimmer. If you scroll down this page, you'll get to the skimmer basin details. Again, they're there in CAD and PDF and include temporary skimmer basins and multi-purpose basins with riser structures. Uh, just briefly, this is our detail. Uh, I will mention that we are in the process of updating our design. That should be out in just about a month. And so please check back. Uh, these details will be updated. We've made some improvements to the product. And, um, but for now, these are the correct details for each model. Um, many of you probably will never see a skimmer actually working um, or you know out in the rain to see one starting to go down. So <clears throat> this is a video of our test pit. Uh, you can see water coming under the guard, going through the orifice on top. And um, once it gets up about a foot or so deep, a vortex will form. Uh, it's not siphoning. That's just a round pipe going through a round hole. So uh, kind of like flushing a toilet. You know, got a vortex there that that flow is going out, uh, flow will stabilize. You'll notice that nothing has been pulled in off the surface. We're pulling water from just below surface, so any trash or debris that's on the surface is staying there. And you may see a very slight reduction in turbidity <coughs> inside the skimmer versus the, the water outside the skimmer. But again, these are not really turbidity devices as much as they're just flow control, and they definitely increase sediment trapping. So I mentioned our new model. So uh, our new model is a little bit different. We're going to have, instead of the plastic guard, we're going to have a fabric skirt around it. Also, uh, the video on the right just shows how it always uh, writes itself. It doesn't twist or turn, always floats correctly, um, very stable, always comes back to the surface, does not get stuck underwater, um, does have a vent tube <coughs> attached to it to ensure no siphoning. So um, that's in our own test tank at our test facility there. So, a couple of quick things: uh, skimmer installation. When you do design your ponds, uh, one issue you'll see here: uh, this pond's always going to have a little bit of water in it. <clears throat> They've graded the pond uh, and then came back in and put in the skimmer pad of stone and then set the skimmer on top of it. So uh, this pond's got to have six to eight inches of water before the skimmer starts flowing. So what you really rather do is have a skimmer pit and put in a little bit of a bowl so that where the skimmer is setting is actually the low point of the pond and excavate out for the stone so the skimmer sits basically at that low grade and that will help you get a grass established in the bottom of your pond rather than having uh, the bottom stay wet as this pond is likely going to do. Uh, they've seen some bad installations. <clears throat> I think you can all recognize what's wrong here. It's important to make sure you've got the right length of pipe. This looks like it may be two feet of pipe on probably a six to eight foot tall riser structure. Obviously that skimmer can't float at all. So um, when you are visiting your sites and doing your site certification, make sure they put in a length of pipe that uh, allows for the skimmer to float up. We typically recommend uh, the pipe length be one and a half times the height of the riser, which will allow for plenty of angle to get up to the to riser. 
uh, skimmers do need to be maintained. Um, you can see this one, you've got two issues going on. One, you've got some sediment accumulated under the pipe leading from the outlet structure to the skimmer. And number two, anytime you see vegetation growing out of the skimmer, that is a sign there's probably a problem there. Uh, this skimmer actually had a good sized root ball growing inside of it, severely restricting the flow. Uh, skimmers can help with maintenance. Um, this pond was one where it had all kinds of trash and debris floating in it. <clears throat> it led to the orifice getting clogged. Um, we end up retrofitting the, the pond with a skimmer and monitoring it for several years. It's been in place since for about four years now, almost five years coming up. Um, you can see this outlet structure was modified, <clears throat> but now we've got the skimmer in place. You can see there's still a fair amount of debris and trash in the pond, but it continues to drain properly. The best example of this is we had an event where the pond had been cut, but the debris had not been pulled from the pond. That afternoon, they got five inches of rain in just a few hours. And picture on the left, you can see all the debris and trash in the pond. However, the skimmer did still drain down <clears throat> and drain the pond out so that they were able to get back in there and clean the pond out and get all the trash out of it. Uh, this is another site in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we uh, <clears throat> had to do some pond retrofits. Uh, this outlet here on the right side uh, was actually covered completely and it was all filled in with sediment and debris. We cleaned that out. Uh, as you can see the picture here on the top left. Um, however, um, after cleaning it out, it's in a natural area. And even though we had a riprap ring, as you can see on the left side, uh, all the debris was floating over that ring and getting in and clogging the outlet. Um, when that would happen, we would often have weeks that it would take to drain. Um, the water would stay up near top of the outlet. And actually, you can't see here, but the picture on the top right uh, has the spillway there and water would end up having to get up to go over that spillway because the low pipe was just getting clogged. We ended up doing a retrofit. Uh, we installed a riser structure and a skimmer um, <clears throat> in this basin. In doing so, uh, Charlotte has a, a stormwater utility fee of about $2,000 per acre per year. Uh, this is apartment complex. It was paying about $25,000 a year in stormwater utility fees. When we did this retrofit, we also did the stormwater fee credit and ended up getting them a 95% reduction in their stormwater fees. So it more than paid for this in about two years. Um, and now they're getting a significant uh, savings every year by having this in place. We continue to monitor it. You can see it's in a natural area, lots of trash, lots of debris. There's actually a live stream that comes through here. And so even with all this debris, uh, it does continue to drain down. Um, at times it does hold a little bit more water. Uh, this was actually just after rain and, and during a uh, time when the spring had a lot of flow. So this area continues to hold a little bit of water just in a natural condition. It's kind of a semi-wet pond, or let's call it extended pond. Um, also, I want to just quickly mention a few other Rymar products that are coming on the market soon. Uh, we have our VersaWaddle. We have two, two versions of it. We have a standard version. That is a foam-filled sediment barrier. It's designed to be trenched in behind curb or sidewalk. Um, wherever you need site access, such as construction entrances. And it's designed to be driven over. So the foam will float up whenever you get a rain event, get water there. Otherwise, it lays down and uh, easy to get construction access back and forth without having to take down silt fence and put it back up. We have another version of our Versal Waddle called the HS, or hard surface model. Uh, this version actually attaches to pavement with some very coarse screws. Now we do have mastic underneath there. So the screws go through mastic to prevent water intrusion into the asphalt. But as you can see, it's designed to trap sediment, but also kick water. In this case, you've got a lip between the asphalt and the curb. This is a subdivision where they've not completed the final paving yet. And um, water is bypassing these boxes until we put the waddles in place. Now the waddles kick the water over into the curb, but as you can see on the left, traps the sediment. The picture on the right, you'll see that we were doing some testing out here just to see how it's working. On the left side, we've got one in place. On the right side, we do not. 
And if you look down the road to the low point, you see a lot of sediment that has gotten actually off of this site, bypassed that box, <coughs> and uh, had some impacts off site that the developer is going to have to clean up. Um, you can see here, this is right after a rain event, water still flowing. <coughs> it's trapped a good bit of sediment. There's very little water bypassing the Versa Waddle on the curb, and nearly all of it is being kicked up over the curb, draining into the catch basin. Again, this product is foam filled, designed to be driven over. Here you can see a dump truck uh, fully loaded, flattens it out pretty well, but it rebounds quickly. Foam filled, um, held in place by screws, and you can see that uh, even with the heavy weight of a dump truck, it, it comes right back. We've also tech tested it with very low riding cars so that it doesn't get caught on a you know a low bumper, low fender. Um, and even if it did, it's, it's a foam filled product. It's not like the something that's filled with you know stone or recycled rubber or some of those that is going to damage a car if it does hit it. So thank you for watching. This was uh, our introduction to skimmer sediment basins uh, from basics to advanced modeling. Um, if you would like to receive CEU or PDH credit, uh, depending on where you've accessed this webinar, uh, some websites will, will provide that for you as part of that. However, if you've just gotten to it through our website or through YouTube, or somewhere that's not offering you continuing education or professional development hours, if you would like credit, simply send us an email. Email info at rymarwaterworks.com. Let us know that you watched the Introduction to Skimmer Sediment Basins webinar, and you would like to take a brief questionnaire to confirm you've viewed it. <clears throat> Once uh, you email us, we'll send you a little short questionnaire. You answer that, send it back to us, and we will send you a certificate for your PDHs uh, that you can then self-report. Again, we thank you very much. My name is Jamie McCutcheon with Rymar Waterworks Innovations, and we appreciate your time and interest in skimmer sediment basins and hopefully particularly the Marley Float Skimmer. Thank you.